Hello, my name is Sean Gilbert. And before we begin our program, I would like to first introduce our interpreter, Ms. Pamela Perales. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Sean Gilbert. Y antes de comenzar nuestro webinar, quisiera presentar a nuestra intérprete, la señora Pamela Perales. Buenas tardes a todos. Esta noche se van a proveer los servicios de interpretación al español en simultáneo. Para escuchar esta presentación en español, en unos momentos usted va a poder eh, acceder a la barra de herramientas en la parte inferior de su On behalf of the Contra Costa County Library, the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley, the League of Women Voters West Contra Costa County, and Contra Costa County TV. Welcome to our webinar, Get the Lowdown on 2022 Propositions, Pros and Cons. Before we begin, I would like to review a few housekeeping items. This is a Zoom webinar, so the audience microphones are muted and videos are turned off. Any questions you may have for the moderators, please submit them using the chat button at the bottom of your screen. A member of our team will share your questions with the moderators during the Q&A portion of the presentation. At the end of today's program, a recording will be posted to the YouTube channels of the Contra Costa County Library and the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley. Site addresses for those YouTube channels will be displayed on screen at the end of the program. Contact information for each moderator will also be posted on the screen. Contra Costa Television will rebroadcast this program. The dates and times will be posted on screen at the end of the webinar as well. Contra Costa, <clears throat> excuse me, television is available on Comcast Channel 27, AT&T UVerse Channel 99, Astound Channel 32, and online at ContraCostaTV.org. The League of Women Voters of the United States believes that democratic government depends upon informed and active participation at all levels of government. As part of its mission to provide nonpartisan political information, leagues have in the past provided in-person impartial presentations about the ballot measures, but COVID-19 posed unique challenges to the in-person format. Consequently, today we are presenting ballot measures, excuse me, ballot measure pro and cons as a Zoom webinar and posting it later as a webinar recording. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan grassroots organization working to protect and expand voting rights and ensure everyone is represented in our democracy. We empower voters and defend democracy through advocacy, education, and litigation at the local, state, and national levels. Now it is with my sincere pleasure to introduce today's moderators, Ms. Linda Whitmore and Ms. Janet Thomas. Ms. Whitmore is a former high school drama teacher who after 36 years retired in 2011. Following her retirement, Ms. Whitmore went on to be a part-time adjunct professor at Contra Costa Community College for nine years. She is a community activist and involved with several community groups in Contra Costa, including the Black Women Organized for Political Action, the NAACP, Reimagining Public Safety Community Task Force, Air Quality Monitoring Outreach Team, Santa Fe Neighborhood Council, and for 10 years, the League of Women Voters West Contra Costa. For the last past three years, Ms. Whitmore's interest and involvement has been in League candidate forums. Recent forums she has coordinated and moderated include West Contra Costa County United, United Unified School Districts uh, School Board, Social Justice and Congressional District 8, Pandemic, Don't Panic, a community conversation with Supervisor John Joya, and most recently, the City of Richmond Mayoral and City Council Candidates Forum. Ms. Whitmore is happy to add today's community conversation, get the lowdown on 2022 propositions, pros and cons to her resume. 
Ms. Janet Thomas is a longtime member of the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley and has served on the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley Board as membership chair and program director. She has once again coordinated with St. Mary's College Communications Department to develop the pros and cons videos you will see today. Ms. Th Ms. Thomas retired from teaching math and science in the Akalani's Unified School District in 2007, where she was science department chair and served too as director of science, excuse me, district science new teacher mentor. Ms. Thomas is currently chairperson of Healthcare for All Contra Costa County and is a founding member and directs the Lafayette Community Garden and Outdoor Learning Center. Mm -hmm. Along with others, she created the city's environmental task force mm -hmm. and is currently chairing the city's diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging committee. Mm -hmm. In 2022, Janet was voted co-citizen of the year mm -hmm. in Lafayette. Mm -hmm. oh. Ms. Whitmore? Oh, well, Ms. thank Whitmore. you, Sean. Thank you very much. Uh, hello. Uh, we'd like to thank you for inviting the League of Women Voters of Dival Valley and West Contra Costa County to make this presentation for the November 2022 state ballot measures. As you heard, today's theme is get down, get the, let me start again. Today's theme is get the lowdown on 2022 propositions, pros and cons. My name is Linda Whitmore, and I am a member of the League of Women Voters of West Contra Costa County. And my league partner is Janet Thomas from the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley. As many of you may already know, the League of Women Voters was founded over 100 years ago in 1920, the year women first gained their rights to vote. Its purpose was, and still is today, to promote an active and informed citizenry for women and men, and men of all ages. The League has two separate distinct roles. The first is education and voter service, and the second is action and advocacy. We never support or oppose a political party or a candidate. We do take um, positions on issues, however, but only after we study them at the local and our state level and arrive at consensus. Now, I would like to introduce you to my co-moderator, Janet Thomas. Thank you, Linda, and um, welcome everyone. Uh, as Linda said today, we're here in our role as educators and we're providing um, voter service. On this year's ballot, there are seven propositions. And in a moment, we're gonna share with you short videos, which will give you important background information about each initiative, as well as the pros and the cons stated by proponents and opponents. The video scripts and PowerPoints were researched and written by the League of Women Voters. And the videos themselves were produced, directed and edited by St. Mary's College students with the help of associate professor Jason Jakaitis. It was wonderful to work with such talented, enthusiastic and responsible young voters who seemed grateful to be involved in such a meaningful project. Now, some of you may have some questions about the propositions and we'll be happy to answer these, but we're gonna wait until after the videos have been shown. So while watching the videos, please post your questions in the chat and we'll answer them in about 40 minutes. Now remember, information changes, so please visit our local COCO Vote, Voters Edge, Ballotpedia, and the Secretary of State's websites to get updated information. And uh, finally, if you're not already a member, we'd like to invite you to join the League of Women Voters. Um, Linda and I are in separate leagues, but if you want to join, you can do so by just visiting lwv.org and then going to your local league's website. So let's begin the videos.
Sorry, are, are the videos not viewable? No, we're not seeing them. Yeah. Okay, I'll go Video's back. Video's not on. Okay, what happened there? Can you see them now? Can you see the yes. screen? Okay. Yes. Sorry about that. Not sure what happened there. Welcome to a discussion of the pros and cons for the 2022 ballot measures, brought to you by the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley and St. Mary's College. Let's talk about Proposition 1. Prop 1 was placed on the ballot by the legislature, and if passed, it will change the California Constitution. The wording for the measure is Constitutional Right to Reproductive Freedom, Legislative Constitutional Amendment. Here's some information about this proposition. If passed, Prop 1 will change the California Constitution to specifically prohibit the state from denying or interfering with an individual's reproductive freedom in their most intimate decisions, which include their fundamental right to choose to have an abortion and their fundamental right to choose or refuse contraceptives. The intention of this constitutional amendment is to further the constitutional right to privacy and the constitutional right to equal protection. To better understand Proposition 1, it's important to have some pertinent background information. Prior to 1973, abortions were prohibited in 33 states and only allowed in special circumstances in 13 others. With the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision of 1973, the U.S. Constitution recognized a protected right to choose an abortion. After that ruling, a variety of court challenges either upheld or rejected laws in a number of ways. For example, a variety of state laws limited the use of taxpayer money to pay for the procedures, required minors to obtain parental consent, required married women to obtain spousal consent, created waiting periods, and required instruction about alternatives to abortion. Yet, throughout this period of court cases, the U.S. Supreme Court continued to uphold the right to choose an abortion. This trajectory changed dramatically with the Dobbs decision this year in which the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade and eliminated any federal protection for the right to choose an abortion. The basis for the Supreme Court decision was that rights that are not explicitly mentioned in the U.S. Constitution must be deeply rooted in history and tradition in order to be guaranteed. Therefore, given this reasoning, some current rights are vulnerable because they may not be considered rooted in history. In a concurring opinion, Justice Clarence Thomas stated that federal protection for other personal rights, such as contraception and same-sex marriage, should also be reconsidered. Although California law currently recognizes the right to privacy in its constitution and recognizes the right to reproductive freedom in both statutory and case law, Proposition 1 seeks to further protect the right to privacy with respect to reproductive decisions. This would mean California would assure the right to choose whether to use birth control or choose to have an abortion. No state so far has a constitutional provision protecting abortion. California, Vermont, and Michigan are the first states to ask voters to put such an amendment in their constitutions. In Kansas, an amendment to prevent the Constitution from protecting abortion rights was resoundingly defeated in a special election in August. There would be no direct budget impacts from Proposition 1 because, while California shares the cost of contraception with the federal government, the state already pays the full cost of abortion through Medi-Cal for eligible low-income California residents. Those supporting Proposition 1 say that California can no longer count on the federal government to protect its rights. So it's important to enshrine the fundamental right to abortion and contraception in the California state constitution as extra protection. The law would ensure that only future state voters, not politicians or justices, could alter those rights. And as noted by the Los Angeles Times editorial board, frankly, every state needs to have the right to abortion stated in its constitution. A Public Policy Institute of California poll in July showed that 68% of Californians disapprove of the U.S. Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. Most doctors, nurses, and health providers agree that it's necessary to keep reproductive medical decisions where they belong, with the individuals and their health care providers, based on scientific facts and not political arguments. Those opposing Proposition 1 said that women already have the right to choose under current California law and that the recent U.S. Supreme Court ruling will not change this. They feel that there is no need to change the California Constitution. Also, there are those who feel we need to protect the rights of the unborn fetus, especially when it reaches a viable age. 
Some of the supporters of Proposition 1 are the California Medical Association, Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California, California Nurses Association, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and the California League of Women Voters. Governor Gavin Newsom, State Senator Tony Adkins, and Nancy Skinner and State Assemblyman Anthony Randon and Phil Ting are also supporters of the proposition. The $3.1 million in contribution funds have come from the Adkins Ballot Measure Committee. Some of the opponents of Proposition 1 are the Republican Party of California, California Conference of Catholic Bishops, and Democrats for Life of America. State Assemblyman James Gallagher and Randy Vopel are also opposed, as is John Fleischman, former executive director of the Republican Party of California. As of September 13, 2022, there have been no contributions against Proposition 1. We have done our best to give you a researched overview of this proposition, but please be aware that there will continue to be updates and additional information. We encourage you to visit the websites of Ballotpedia, the California Secretary of State, Easy Voter, and the Voter's Edge to stay informed. Thank you very much and please remember to vote. Welcome to a discussion of the pros and cons of the 2022 ballot measures, brought to you by the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley and St. Mary's College. Let's talk about Proposition 26. Proposition 26 is worded on the ballot as allows in-person roulette, dice games, sports wagering on tribal Indian lands. Here's a little background. The California Constitution generally prohibits gambling. Over the years, the Constitution has been amended to allow some forms of gambling in certain locations. Currently, both the California Lottery and card rooms in which games similar to poker are legal. Betting on horse races is also legal, and American Indian-owned casinos, slot machines, and certain card games are allowed. On the other hand, sports betting in California is illegal. The lack of legal sports betting does not mean that Californians do not engage in it. An unpublished study from 2019 estimated that Californians were making billions of dollars in sports bets either through bookies or offshore companies. And current law does not prohibit fantasy league betting because it's not based on scores of a real game, but rather involves adding up points of individual players from a fantasy scenario. American Indian tribe casinos do not pay state or local taxes, but do pay state and local governments a fee based on their casino revenue at a rate that is negotiated by each tribe. Some tribes distribute a portion of the profits the casino makes in the form of per capita payment, in which case tribal members pay federal taxes on their income. In many cases, casino income is used to benefit communities supporting education, buildings, and services. And casinos also provide jobs. If passed, Proposition 26 will do the following. It would legalize in-person sports betting at American Indian casinos and the four licensed racetracks in California. Sports betting is defined as wagering on the results of professional, college, and amateur sport and athletic events. It would not allow betting on high school sports or events involving a California college team. At racetracks, sports betting could only be offered to people 21 or older. Age restrictions on sports betting at tribal casinos would need to be negotiated by California's governor and each tribe, and written into each tribe's compact with the state. It would also legalize roulette and dice games such as craps at tribal casinos. However, existing tribal state compacts would need to be amended before those games could be offered. The proposition also creates a new way of enforcing some gaming laws, allowing anyone to bring a lawsuit if they believe the laws are being violated and the state justice department declines to act. Any penalty and settlement money that results will go to the state. The fiscal impacts of Prop 26 for California and local governments are not certain, but state revenue will probably increase in the tens of millions of dollars each year. It's difficult to know the exact amount for a few reasons. New tribal state compacts might require tribes to pay more to local governments, and it's not clear how much money will go to the state as a result of new private lawsuits. Any revenue to the state would first be spent on education, spending commitments, and regulatory costs. 70% of money left over would go into the general fund, 15% to gambling enforcement, and 15% to problem gaming and mental health research. Those supporting Prop 26 say that Prop 26 will continue to aid the American Indian tribes in developing self-sufficiency and lifting them out of poverty. Much of the revenue made in the casinos is used to enhance schools, housing, public safety, and Native American community programs. 
For example, the casino in San Pablo now generates 60% of the city's general fund revenue and is the third largest employer. Prop 26 will allow in-person sports wagering at highly regulated Indian casinos and allow the casinos to offer additional games which will bring in more revenue not only for the tribes but also for the state. Casinos in California currently create 150,000 jobs and expanding casinos will increase the number of jobs created. Also, requiring sports wagering in person provides the strongest age verification safeguards to prevent underage gambling. And Prop 26 will strengthen enforcement of California's gaming laws to crack down on illegal gambling. Those opposing Prop 26 say that it is clearly an expansion of gambling that will lead to more gambling addiction. Prop 26 is sponsored by five wealthy gaming tribes that want to expand their monopoly on gambling to include sports betting. Many fear that these powerful interests will use new legal enforcement provisions in Prop 26 to put existing card rooms not on the tribal lands out of business. These card rooms are often in California's lower income communities of color, where they provide income as well as jobs. This proposition will expand gambling at horse racetracks. Horse racing is known to take a toll on horses' bodies, and sometimes unhealthy drugs are given to enhance racing. Also, those horses that don't perform well are often sent to be slaughtered for meat, even at a young age. Finally, current jobs at tribal casinos are non-union jobs, which offer few benefits and little job security. As of September 9, 2022, the supporters of Prop 26 are 31 California tribes and tribal associations, 19 city and county Democratic Central Committees, the Indian Chamber of Commerce, Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis, and the California State Treasurer Fiona Ma. The Yes on 26, no on 27th, Coalition for Safe Responsible Gambling has raised just over $73 million. The top donors are five different California Indian tribes. As of September 9, 2022, the opponents of Prop 26 are Republican Party of California, Election Entertainment Group, Hawaiian Gardens Casino, Hollywood Park Casino, Night Adventures LLC, California Animal Welfare Association, California Black Chamber of Commerce, and the Mercury News and East Bay Times editorial staffs. Financial contributions against Prop 26 total about $42 million. Those contributing over $2 million are the California Commerce Club Casino, Hawaiian Gardens Casino, Night Adventure, Park West Casinos, and the Bicycle Hotel and Casino. We have done our best to give you a research overview of this proposition, but please be aware that there will continue to be updates and additional information. We encourage you to visit the websites of Ballotpedia, the California Secretary of State, Easy Voter, and Voters Edge to stay informed. Thank you very much and please remember to vote. Welcome to a discussion of the pros and cons for the 2022 ballot measures brought to you by the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley and St. Mary's College. Let's talk about Proposition 27. Proposition 27 is an initiative constitutional amendment, worded, allows online and mobile sports wagering outside tribal lands. Here's a little background. The California Constitution and California statutes currently define what types of gambling are allowed in the state. Currently, it is legal to play the California lottery, bet on a horse race, put wagers down in card games in certain card rooms, and gamble in American Indian owned casinos. The casinos are allowed to operate slot machines, lottery games, and certain types of card games. The rules governing American Indian-owned casinos are set by compacts between the owner tribes and the state. Currently, betting on sports events is not legal in California. The U.S. Supreme Court, however, ended the federal prohibition on sports betting in 2018, opening the door for states to legalize the practice. About 30 states have taken that step so far. Since the California legislature has failed to come up with legislation addressing sports betting, initiatives are being placed on the ballot to help craft what would be legal in California. If passed, Proposition 27 would do the following. It would legalize mobile sports betting and dedicate some of the revenue to the California Solutions to Homelessness and Mental Health Support Account and the Tribal Economic Development Account. Licensed tribes or gambling companies who meet certain monetary criteria could offer online sports betting over the internet and mobile devices to people 21 years of age and older on non-tribal lands in California. Online sports betting entities would be required to pay the state a share of their sports betting profit. A new state unit would be created to regulate online sports betting. New ways to reduce illegal online sports betting would be available. 
The fiscal impact on the state and local budget if Prop 27 passes depends on a number of variables, such as the number of entities that offer online betting, the possible renegotiation of compacts between state and tribes that offer online betting, and the number of people that engage in online betting. There is a potential for increase in state revenue reaching from hundreds of millions up to $500 million each year. Some or all of the regulatory costs would be offset by the payments sports betting operators must pay to the state for regulation. Those supporting Prop 27 say that it would provide hundreds of millions of dollars to support programs that alleviate homelessness, mental health, and addiction in California. Online betting is currently happening in California through offshore operators and bookies. Many feel online gambling should be legal in California as it is in other states. And Prop 27 will give those tribes who could afford the operating fees even more revenue for their tribes. Those opposing Prop 27 say that it is being pushed by the out-of-state online gambling industry and will generate billions of dollars for their companies, most of which will leave the state. It costs a sporting entity $10 million to become an online betting organization, making it almost impossible for smaller gaming companies to compete. Many tribes with casinos and smaller card rooms are concerned that they're going to see decreases in clientele, and as a result, a loss of jobs and revenue if Prop 27 passes. Also, opponents feel that since a person can make a bet from any mobile device, it will make gambling much easier and add to gambling addiction, which is a major cause of bankruptcy and resulting homelessness. In addition, it would be extremely difficult to impose the 21-year-old age limit on those placing online bets. Finally, legalizing online gambling is not a solution to homelessness or other social ills. The supporters of Prop 27 are Californians for Solutions to Homelessness and Mental Health Support, a PAC that is leading the campaign. Supporters include the mayors of Fresno, Long Beach, Oakland, and Sacramento, and three major bands of American Indian tribes. Another supporter is Major League Baseball. As of September 10, 2022, supporters had raised over $100 million. The top supporters are BetMGM, $16.7 million, FanDuel Sportsbook, $16.7 million, and Crown Gaming, $16.7 million. As of September 10th, 2022, the opposition against Prop 27 is being led by the Coalition for Safe, Responsible Gaming. Opposition includes the Democratic and Republican parties of California and the Democratic and Republican heads of each branch of the state legislature. Also opposing the initiative are over 50 California Indian tribes and the California Teachers Association and Communications Workers of America. By September 9, 2022, opponents had raised over $114 million. The main contributors are five bands of American Indian tribes, each of which contributed over $10 million. We have done our best to give you a researched overview of this proposition, but please be aware that there will continue to be updates and additional information. We encourage you to visit the websites of Ballotpedia, the California Secretary of State, Easy Voter, and Voters Edge to stay informed. Thank you very much, and please remember to vote. Welcome to a discussion of the pros and cons for the 2022 ballot measures brought to you by the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley and St. Mary's College. Let's talk about Proposition 28. Proposition 28 is an initiative that is worded on the ballot as provides additional funding for arts and music education in public schools. Here's some information about this proposition. If passed, this proposition would require that the state provide funding specifically for arts and music education in K-12 public schools. This funding would be in addition to the funding already guaranteed to schools by Prop 98, passed in 1988, and would be at least 1% of the funding received by schools from Prop 98. The legislature could reduce funding for arts and music following a two-thirds vote from both the Senate and Assembly that reduces total funding. Distribution of funding would be based on enrollment. 70% would be allocated to schools based on numbers of students, and 30% would be allocated to schools based on proportion of students from low-income households. A school's principal would be responsible for planning how the funding would be spent. Schools with more than 500 students would be required to spend 80% of funding to employ staff and 20% on training and supplies. Each year, local school boards would be required to certify that their school spent the funding provided by Prop 28 on music and arts education and report publicly how this money was used. To give you a little background, our public schools serve about 6 million K-12 students. Districts are under the jurisdiction of local governing boards. 
Roughly 60% of California public school students are from low-income families. Prop 98, passed in 1988, changed the California Constitution to require a minimum percentage of the state budget on K-14 education. In any fiscal year, however, with a two-thirds vote from both State Senate and Assembly, California could provide less funding than that required by Prop 98. There is currently no guaranteed source of annual funding specifically for arts and music education in K-12 public schools. There are some state-funded enrichment programs which may contain arts and music education. State law requires schools to provide arts and music instruction to all students in grades 1 through 6 and students in grades 7 and 8 must be offered art and music as an elective. High school students currently must complete one year of arts or music to graduate. If this proposition passes, the budget impact on state and local governments is likely to be a spending of $800 million to $1 billion each year. This is less than one half of 1% of the state's general fund. Those supporting Proposition 28 say that Prop 28 would increase funding for educational programs without raising taxes. They add that currently only one in five California public schools has a dedicated teacher for arts or music programs compared to other states, such as New York, where over 75% of schools have designated arts or music instructors. And finally, they emphasize that studies have shown that arts and music education improve a student's personal life and academic potential and provide skills such as computer graphics, which could lead to a variety of employment opportunities. Those opposing Proposition 28 say that this is not the way to create a budget for schools. They say that requiring a set amount for music and art education reduces the ability of the state to fund other programs that are equally important. Also, if enrollment declines, this would reduce flexibility to shift funding from schools to other programs. The main supporters of this initiative are Californians for Arts and Music in Public Schools, California Teachers Association, and California State PTA. The fiscal support for this measure has mainly come from the former superintendent of Los Angeles Unified School District, Austin Butner, an ex-financial investment broker. He has contributed over $3 million. Other contributors of over a million dollars are two individuals and Fender Musical Instruments. There are currently no public opponents of Proposition 28. Two newspapers have written editorials opposing the measure, the LA Times and the East Bay Times. They say that this is not a good time to add a requirement for use of general funds. We have done our best to give you a researched overview of this proposition, but please be aware that there will continue to be updates and additional information. We encourage you to visit the websites of Ballotpedia, the California Secretary of State, Easy Voter, and Voters Edge to stay informed. Thank you very much, and please remember to vote. Welcome to a discussion of the pros and cons for the 2022 ballot measures, brought to you by the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley and St. Mary's College. Let's talk about Proposition 29. Proposition 29 is an initiative that is worded on the ballot as requires on-site licensed medical professional at kidney dialysis clinics and establishes other state requirements. Here's some information about Proposition 29. If passed, this proposition would require at least one licensed physician, nurse practitioner, or physician assistant on site during treatment at kidney dialysis clinics. The California Department of Public Health can make an exception when there's a shortage of these practitioners, in which case telehealth must be utilized. Prop 29 also requires that clinics provide patients with a list of all physicians who have ownership interests in the clinic of 5% or more, and continue reporting this information to the state every three months. If they fail to do so, they could be fined $100,000. The proposition requires reporting of dialysis-related infections to a state agency and mandates state approval for clinics to close or reduce services. Clinics would have to offer the same level of care to all patients, regardless of whether the treatment is paid for by private insurance or a government-funded program such as Medi-Cal or Medicare. To give you a little background about Proposition 29, about 80,000 Californians receive hemodialysis every month in one of the 650 dialysis centers in California. This treatment, which cleanses the blood of waste products, is usually done three times a week, and each treatment lasts four hours. Most clinics are open six days a week. Nearly three-quarters of these clinics are owned by two for-profit corporations, DeVita Inc. and Fresenius Medical Care. The California Department of Public Health is responsible for licensing chronic dialysis clinics to operate in California, using federal regulations as the basis for licensing. 
Currently, all chronic dialysis clinics must be licensed using federal regulations to receive Medicare and Medi-Cal payments. Two current requirements are that a board-certified medical doctor be affiliated with each chronic dialysis center and be responsible for quality of care, staff training, and clinic practices. In addition, infections must be reported to the National Healthcare Safety Network on kidney-related infections. This is the third proposition that has been supported by the SEIU United Health Workers West, a labor union for healthcare workers. SEIU says that workers at dialysis clinics have been attempting to unionize since 2016 and have faced some retaliation by employers. In February 2017, SEIU began efforts to pass a 2018 proposition, Proposition 8, which would have put a 15% ceiling on the profits of private operators. The dialysis industry defeated that measure with a record $111 million campaign. In 2020, SEIU put Proposition 23 on the ballot, which would have required a physician to be on site during dialysis treatment. That proposition was defeated by 63% to 27% vote, with about $121 million spent on the campaign. 85% of that by the opponents, who were mainly the dialysis corporations. This year's Proposition 29 has again been introduced by SEIU, who continues to say they want to improve safety for patients and reduce stress on workers. Also, they want to make sure that patients and the public get more information about ownership of clinics, as increasing numbers of doctors are collaborating on joint venture ownerships, which may or may not create conflict of interest situations. The fiscal impact of the passage of Prop 29 on state and local government is uncertain. However, it's thought that if this proposition passes, clinic owners will most likely negotiate higher insurance payments to offset increased staffing costs. The budget impact on the state would most likely be in the low tens of millions of dollars annually. The state would have to pay for increased dialysis treatment costs for Medi-Cal patients, as well as increased administrative responsibilities at the state level. Those supporting Proposition 29 do so because they feel chronic dialysis clinics need to be better regulated and supervised. Dialysis is a potentially dangerous procedure, and having a trained doctor, nurse practitioner, or physician assistant on site during patient treatment hours would assure more oversight. Also, proponents feel that patients and the public should know who owns the clinics and will profit from the treatment there. Proponents want to make sure that no one is turned away due to source of payment for services and that service for everyone is comparable. Proponents state that dialysis companies are making windfall profits of about 18%, and some of these profits should be spent on improving oversight and care. Those opposing Proposition 29 say that this change could increase dialysis treatment costs by hundreds of millions of dollars every year, and that as a result, they feel that nearly half of the clinics in the state might become financially unstable and forced to close. They also feel that asking a doctor, nurse practitioner, or physician assistant be on site is unnecessary for patient safety. Currently, only eight states have regulations mandating staffing ratios, and there's no evidence that these staffing requirements have improved care. They say that data gathered by Medicare, which pays for most dialysis care, shows that California is doing better, with lower infection rates than in states that have more defined staffing requirements in place. Nurses and other technicians are adequately trained to administer dialysis and respond to special needs. There's also concern that this might result in a shortage of doctors in other necessary areas of care. Leading the campaign in support of Prop 29 is Californians for Kidney Dialysis Patient Protection. The main financial supporter of the proposition is Service Employees International Union, SEIU, United Healthcare Workers West. As of September 6, 2022, the union had donated $7.9 million. Opponents of Proposition 29 are the two largest dialysis businesses, DeVita Incorporated and Fresenius Medical Care, the Republican Party of California, American Academy of Nephrology Physician Assistants, California Medical Association, California Taxpayer Protection Committee, National Hispanic Medical Association, and California Chamber of Commerce. The main financial supporters of the opposition are the two largest dialysis businesses, DeVita and Fresenius. As of September 6th of this year, They've contributed $36.7 million to defeat Prop 29. We've done our best to give you a research overview of this proposition, but please be aware that there will continue to be updates and additional information. We encourage you to visit the websites of Ballotpedia, the California Secretary of State, Easy Voter, and Voters Edge to stay informed. Thank you very much, and please remember to vote.
Welcome to a discussion of the pros and cons for the 2022 ballot measures, brought to you by the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley and St. Mary's College. Let's talk about Proposition 30. The wording on this initiative statute is, provides funding for programs to reduce air pollution and prevent wildfires by increasing tax on personal income over $2 million. Here's some background information. California is experiencing severe drought, with increasing wildfires and poor air quality. Most people think that drought is caused in large part by global warming. Gas-powered cars and wildfire smoke are the two largest sources of greenhouse gas, or GHG, in the state. Both also contribute to poor air quality. State law requires California to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions level to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. State law also requires ride-sharing companies such as Lyft and Uber to have 90% of their drivers using zero-emission vehicles, or ZEVs, by 2030. Further, a current plan was just issued by the governor on August 25th indicating that by 2035, 100% of new vehicles sold must be ZEVs. The state recently committed to spending $10 billion over the next five years on ZEVs and is currently spending between $2 and $4 billion annually on wildfire response. The money from Prop 30 would be in addition to this. Costs for wildfire suppression and prevention are increasing as the fires become more catastrophic. Proposition 30 proposes an increase of the income tax rate by 1.75% on individual incomes above $2 million. Currently, income over $1 million is taxed 1% to fund mental health programs. The current marginal income tax rate in California is 12.3% on people filing jointly for income over $1.25 million. If Proposition 30 passes, the rate will be 15.05% for each dollar above $2 million in income. This rate is higher than any other state in the U.S. The tax increase would end on January 1st, 2043 or earlier if there are three consecutive years when California greenhouse gas emissions are 80% below 1990 levels. The allocation of the net funds from Proposition 30 would be the following. 45% to promote purchase of ZEVs, including subsidies and rebates. 35% to increase availability of electric charging stations. 20% to help fund wildfire suppression and prevention. Further, Proposition 30 stipulates that at least 50% of funds allocated for ZEVs and zero emission vehicle charging must primarily benefit low income and disadvantaged communities. It also requires that CAL FIRE hire and train additional firefighters as their top priority. The fiscal impact on the state is that Proposition 30 would generate $2.8 to $4 billion for ZEV funding and $700 million to $1 billion for wildfire response. These revenues could increase over time. Those supporting Proposition 30 say that existing programs are insufficient to address California's poor air quality due to automobile exhaust and wildfire smoke. So, there's a critical need for revenue to initiate more programs to make electric vehicles more affordable and to prevent catastrophic wildfires that are destroying homes. They claim that there will be strict accountability to ensure that these funds are spent as intended. Lyft is a main proponent of this proposition. Many environmentalists say that Lyft's involvement is tangential to the real existential threat posed by climate change for everyone. Supporters say that this is a Robin Hood type of ballot measure that's trying to fund financial incentives to help those people who don't now have the means to buy an electric car. Those opposing Proposition 30 say that California is already investing more than $50 billion in climate issues, including $10 billion for zero emission vehicles, and that additional funds can be paid from the state's budget surplus. Opponents also say that there is no guarantee that Proposition 30 will make zero emission vehicles affordable for most Californians. Another criticism by opponents is that Proposition 30 locks in money from income taxes to special interests, keeping it away from school funding, which normally relies on these income tax revenues. And they claim that Proposition 30 is Lyft's attempt to get taxpayers to help foot the bill for requiring an increase in the number of electrical vehicles used. Some of the organizations supporting Proposition 30 are Lyft Corporation, California Democratic Party, National Resources Defense Council, Union of Concerned Scientists, California State Firefighters, and the American Lung Association. Individuals supporting Proposition 30 include U.S. Representatives Ro Khanna, Barbara Lee, and Tom Steyer, President of NextGen Climate. Contributions for Proposition 30 total around $15.5 million as of September 11, 2022, with the largest contributor being Lyft at $15 million. 
Some of the organizations opposing Proposition 30 are Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, California Small Business Association, California Teachers Association, and Republican Party of California. Governor Gavin Newsom also opposes this proposition, saying it's fiscally irresponsible and puts the profits of a single corporation ahead of the welfare of the entire state. As of September 10, 2022, there's been $8 million in funding against Proposition 30. We've done our best to give you a researched overview of this proposition, but please be aware that there will continue to be updates and additional information. We encourage you to visit the websites of Ballotpedia, the California Secretary of State, Easy Voter and Voters Edge to stay informed. Thank you very much and please remember to vote. Welcome to a discussion of the pros and cons for the 2022 ballot measures brought to you by the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley and St. Mary's College. Let's talk about Proposition 31. Proposition 31 is a referendum on a 2020 law that would prohibit the retail sale of certain flavored tobacco products. A referendum asks that a law that has already been passed by the legislature and signed by the governor be approved by the voters. It is put on the ballot if enough signatures are gathered. The law at issue cannot be enforced until the election is held. So, in this case, voting yes on Proposition 31 means that you support legislation SB 793 passed in 2020 that prohibits sale of certain flavored tobacco products. Voting no on this proposition means that you want to overturn SB 731 and support the continuation of sale of certain flavored tobacco products. To give you a little background, in August 2020, SB 793 was signed into law. 84 of 89 Democrats and a quarter of Republicans supported the bill. It prohibits in-store retailers and vending machines from possessing flavored tobacco products with the intent to sell. As one of the bill's supporters said, using candy, fruit, and other alluring flavors, the tobacco industry weaponized its tactics to beguile a new generation into nicotine addiction, while keeping longtime users hooked. The legislative ban included flavored juices which can be used to vape, menthol cigarettes, chewing tobacco, and flavored cigarillos but excluded hookah and premium cigars. In 2009, federal law banned cigarettes with non-tobacco flavors, except menthol. In April of this year, the FDA proposed banning menthol-flavored cigarettes and all non-tobacco flavored cigars. A final decision by the FDA has not yet been made. State and local governments regulate sales and use of tobacco and can mandate stricter rules than the federal government. Right now, about one-third of Californians live in areas with rules banning certain sales of flavored tobacco products, most of which include a ban on menthol cigarettes. The fiscal impact of the passage of Proposition 31 has to do with taxes the state collects from sales. It would reduce state tobacco tax revenue up to $100 million a year. The size of the revenue loss depends on whether smokers would switch from flavored to non-flavored tobacco products therefore having little effect on tobacco tax revenues. Also, since state and local governments pay for health care for their employees and qualifying low-income residents, if Prop 31 passes, it would likely reduce tobacco use, leading to better health and thus reducing health care costs. In short, the net change in state and local government health care costs is uncertain. Those supporting Proposition 31 do so because they feel that flavored tobacco is a gateway to addiction among children. They say that Big Tobacco has spent millions of dollars lobbying so California retailers could keep selling candy-flavored products to children. In the U.S., more than 2 million middle and high school students now use e-cigarettes, many for the enjoyment of the flavors they taste. Four out of five young people who have used tobacco started with a flavored product. Those opposing Proposition 31 do so because they feel the law is unfair since lawmakers have exempted hookah tobacco, expensive cigars, and flavored pipe tobacco from the prohibition. Also, this prohibition will hurt small businesses and jobs as products are pushed from licensed resellers to an underground market. This leads to increased youth access, crime, and other social concerns. Finally, the state will lose valuable tax revenue. The main supporter of this initiative is the California Teachers Association. The California League of Women Voters also supports this proposition, as do Gavin Newsom and Jim Knox, director of the American Cancer Society. 
Journals showing support are the Santa Cruz Sentinel Editorial Board and Bay Area Reporter Editorial Board. The main financial supporters of Prop 31 as of September 8, 2022 are Michael Bloomberg, who contributed $4.2 million, Kaiser Foundation Health Plan, contributing $1.1 million, and the American Heart Association, contributing $100,000. The total amount donated in favor of Prop 31 is $5.3 million. Opponents of Proposition 31 are no on Proposition 31, Californians against Prohibition. Financial support for the opposition has come from R.J. Reynolds and Philip Morris USA, each donating over $10 million, and ITG Brands, which distributes Winston, Cool, and other cigarette products. ITG donated $500,000. The total amount donated against Prop 31 as of September 8th is $8.2 million. We have done our best to give you a researched overview of this proposition, but please be aware that there will continue to be updates and additional information. We encourage you to visit the websites of Ballotpedia, the California Secretary of State, Easy Voter, and Voters Edge to stay informed. Thank you very much and please remember to vote. Okay, <laughs> we're back. Okay, Janet, you're muted. Thank you. Yes. Thank you all. Yes, I want to thank um, our operator for this, um, the videos, Albert. I don't know his last name, I'm sorry. Um, for Garcia, great and, and sorry about the uh, problem at the beginning. Garcia, right. Thank you, Albert. Thank you that's, very much. That's fine, Albert. It was fine, and the yes. sound was great. Um, I got a lot of, uh, not a lot, but a few comments about how pleased people were uh, as to the information. So everything went well. And um, Linda, I don't know, I'm, I'm surprised we haven't, we didn't get many questions, did we? No, and I've been looking during the entire time that um, there are a couple of, I have two questions, but I'm still looking and I might find a few more. Uh, while you're answering it, I'm going to ask the questions. Okay. And Janet, who has been um, involved from the beginning, putting this together uh, for the propositions, pros and cons, will be answering the questions. So the first question, Janet, that I have mm -hmm. uh, for Prop 26. Yes. Is, can you please summarize what is happening in the Indian casinos and racetracks now and what will change? Okay, well, what's happening now are they're, they're basically allowing uh, certain card games in the casinos, racetracks, um, if any of you have been to the racetracks, uh, they allow betting on the racehorses. And what would change is that they would increase the number of games that could be played, they would add roulette, um, they would add dice games, um, right now they have slot machines, so they would that they would continue to to um, obviously operate. The main change here is it would allow sports betting, which is betting on teams. It could be major league teams, it could be college teams. Um, sports betting is you know really big in many uh, states, especially Nevada, and a lot of money is made. Um, this then could be actually the sports betting could occur on the tribal lands um, in their in the casinos, and it could possibly potentially generate a lot of income for those uh, Native American um, uh, tribes. Um, some of that money would go to localities. Um, some of it would go to the state. They, as, as was mentioned in the videos, they, each tribe has a contract with the state and negotiates that way. And I think though, and I, I think it's really important to point out, one of the um, problems with this, other than it would increase um, uh, racing, um, it, it, because it would, uh, it, it would, it, it, what basically sports betting would be allowed on racetracks as well. So it, it, the, the thought is more people would be coming to the racetracks. So people who are against race horse racing to begin with, because of uh, welfare of animals, um, 
feel that um, this is a basically um, it, it's an event that um, can enhance cruelty to animals. Uh, another thing that would happen, as was mentioned in the videos, uh, the, it would um, implement a new uh, state uh, agency to govern um, uh, basically the, 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 the betting. And anyone could, who wanted to could in fact file a, a suit and there's a possibility they could get $10,000 if they saw some illegality. Um, the small card rooms that are in many of our locations, lower income neighborhoods, basically, um, existing card rooms, they're afraid that in, that in fact litigation is going to put them out of business, that they couldn't afford to basically fight their case. Um, I hope that that answers the question. It's it's main and, and again, one of this was mentioned, one of the main oppositions that it would increase gambling and a number of people feel that even though it would contribute to the money, um, you know, to, to some uh, tribes um, that that gambling is addictive. Okay, thank okay, you. Sure. There was a comment earlier, they want to know um, about online resources for uh, researching who donated uh, right. towards these propositions, but I think yeah. every proposition stated that very it, clearly. It you could go back to those, but I would really recommend um, those, you know, we wrote most of these mid-September and I went back and looked and believe it or not, some of the financial contributions have doubled since then. Mm -hmm. There is now for 26 and 27, um, half a billion dollars has been wow. spent. Whereas it was 300 million, I think when I wrote the, the we wrote the scripts. Um, it, 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 you can go to Ballotpedia and Voters Edge. Those are probably, you know, two of the best sources for money. Um, you know, as I said, the, the, the videos will be available, but Ballotpedia and um, Voters Edge are, are probably the best resources. Okay. Thank you. Uh, our next question is for Prop 31. Now, a yes. uh, question for you, Janet. Do I need to give you the name of the person or just the question? I think uh, just the question. Okay, want to make sure. So this is for Prop 31. If there is a law, why is there? Why is this prop needed? Okay. Um, well, <laughs> that's 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 a, this is a good uh, basically civic good civics lesson. Uh, a law can, can be passed and signed by the governor, but we have in our initiative system the ability of the voters to ask for that to be overturned. So that's what a referendum is. Now, uh, someone has to collect enough signatures to put it on the ballot, just as we do with any of our other initiatives. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I um, Prop 31, by the way, you know, is, is the one about the um, tobacco, the flavored tobacco. And basically flavoring tobacco was outlawed except for the hookah and the, um, the cigars. Um, and that was two years ago. Uh, some of the reasons that people put a referendum on the ballot and uh, is basically to buy time. So in those two years, since the, the, the law was passed, the tobacco industry has been able to continue to, to sell menthol. And I mean to sell flavored um, cigarettes. So I I, um, I think that it, it it you know it's a under, to answer the question it's because in California we have the, this um, system that allows us to um, to have a referendum on a, a law. Okay. So I'll 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 stay with thirty one because the next question um, says what does yes on thirty one mean? Okay, yes means you you approve of the law. The law banning that, that that basically is banning the sale of certain flavored tobacco presents products. So a yes means you you want to ban them. A yes is yes on the ban. A no is I don't want it banned. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we're going to Proposition One. Yes. Uh, would it require California California to pay for abortions for out of state residents who seek abortions here? Uh, no, uh, prop, prop one, um, it, it basically Medicaid would cover um, our, our Medi-Cal patients. Um, you know, I, I have to say, I'm not 100% sure if someone were on Medicaid in another state, I would imagine their Medicaid would pay, but I, I am not sure about that if, if in fact it had been born, uh, banned in that state. Um, but I, I did, you know, so, so to answer that question, 
um, from someone coming from another state, I'm not sure. And I would be glad to get back to that person to find out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll be able to save our chat so you can go to them and uh, answer. Okay, or if they wanted to put their email address in. Oh, okay, the yeah, yeah so this was- I'd be um, happy to find that out for them. Okay, okay. Uh, another question on uh, Prop 1. Yes. Does it allow more leniency than existing California abortion laws? I am so glad this has been asked because there's um, really a, a big misunderstanding around this right now. Right now, we actually have statutes, which are laws that allow abortion up to the viability of the fetus, which is about 24 um, uh, months. I mean, and, and that's something, uh, weeks, excuse me, weeks. And that's something that's, um, you know, medically determined, but it's generally about 24 weeks. Or if there is a danger to the, to the mother's um, uh, health. Now that will stay on the books. So that will stay on the books. So what Prop 1 does is it actually puts in the constitution a general um, uh, amendment that says that um, women, or that, that people have um, a right over their reproductive choices. So one of the reasons that, um, that states are considering doing this is because in the past, when a state has tried to um, ban abortion, the, the federal government was there to protect um, the, that right through Roe v. Wade. And when that was overturned, um, there isn't now that um, you know, constitutional protection. And a constitutional amendment, um, if in fact there were no constitutional amendment, then to um, a legislator, le legislature, could overturn statute without the voters having any, any you know, vote. Whereas a constitutional amendment, it would go back to the voters. So there's a little bit more protection in that regard. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, the next question is about Prop 30. Yes. Will, will corporations be taxed as part of Prop 30 or only individuals? Well, corporations pay an income tax as well. So it would be, um, oh, you know what? I, I'll, I'll take, I, I, quite honestly, I'm not sure because it does say in the, in the proposition individual uh, income tax. So um, I'm not sure of that. I, I believe it is just individual um, uh, income tax. But that's, again, if that person wants me to get back with, to, with that information, I'd be happy to. Okay. Does a yes on Prop 30 help firefighters? Oh, yes. The, the, a yes on Prop 30 um, gives the firefighters a, a, up to a billion dollars more in, in, in tax money. So uh, it, it is, and, and what, what they'll use that money for is to, to hire new, more firefighters and to really do wildfire prevention. Okay. Let's see. Where does the online betting increase part of Prop 1 come in? Big emphasis in the TV ads. Okay, where does the online industry come in? That's where does online betting increase part of Prop One come in? I'm sorry, Prop Thirty of uh, Prop Twenty Nine. No, this in one Prop One. Okay. Where does the online betting increase part of Prop One come in? Okay, Prop 1 is the abortion amendment, so I'm not quite sure what... Yeah, I think they have the wrong uh, proposition here. Unless they're talking here. about, yeah, Prop 29. So yeah, I think so. I think we're talking about 29. No, not 29. Um, 20, 20, I'm sorry, uh, 27. Yeah, if, they 27. Could clarify, if they could clarify that, that would be helpful. Yeah, uh, that was from... Um, I just have Kathy. So Kathy, if you want to come on and clarify your question, uh, Janet will be glad to answer it. <laughs> okay. Um, I've heard that the state would likely have to spend money on hiring new firefighters, whether the clear, whether the clean, clean air act passed or not is okay. Hmm. Is this true? In other words, this is just a way for them to increase taxes and not have to pull from the general fund. No, I believe this is an additional amount of money that would go to hiring firefighters. So, it, it, um, yeah. 
and, and it would be by increasing taxes yes yeah uh, this is a a quick question they say okay quick question i thought i heard of a yes on 26 a no on 27 or vice versa organization i think i misheard can you confirm one way or the other no yes it, you did not miss here the main uh supporter of 26 is a yes on 26 and they are the same native tribes that are against 27. Uh, what 27 does in many ways is takes um, the control of gambling in California out of the hands of the tribes and puts it the online into you know a larger um, uh, corporations outside of this state. Um, to, to buy in, as it mentioned in the video, to buy to be one of these online uh, Native American uh, concerns, you would have you have to put in ten million dollars up front and then a million dollars a year, and there are few uh, tribes that can afford that. So you know that that basically the tribes don't want competition. Most of them that 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 exist. So m m most of the tribes who are for twenty six are against twenty seven, and they they created a pack um to, to together to basically support one and and um and be be an opponent of the other however both could pass and if so both would be in place there's no conflict um uh, anyway mm -hmm. okay so kathy responded she said she meant uh props 26 27 so where does the online betting increase part of props 26 or 27 come in? Okay. Big emphasis in the TV ads. Okay. So it, prop 27 is online. 26 has nothing to do with online betting. So if you're if you're wondering, you know, which of these propositions has to do with online, it's it's 27. Um, 27 again would allow uh, online. Um, betting and uh, in in California, and they there it, it, as mentioned in the video, and I'll just repeat a few of the the points. Um, Twenty one years old, of age or over, but it would be very hard to control that, and most of that money would go to corporations that are outside of our states. Whereas the the other states that now um, have laws. Um, most of the money that's being made is, is actually staying, or a lot of it is staying, most of it is staying in the state. So what 26 and 27, I hope, it, it, I, I want to apologize. I know one person said, you know, these videos are going so fast. There's a lot of information I know. You can go back and, and listen again. Um, we were, were looking at 45 minutes is probably the optimum amount of time someone would want to sit. So I apologize. One of the points that was made, um, you know, in, in, in the, the videos about this was um, that just a, a couple of years ago, a huge law changed legalizing gambling. Before, there was only gambling allowed in about, I think it was three states, and um, a law was passed by the federal government that, that if the, the gambling that was allowed could stay, but all of their gam that no other state could have gambling. Well, that was reversed because it didn't seem fair. So 30 states got on board with their legislatures and, and in the last two years have crafted laws about gambling. Our state hasn't done that. And so that's why the Native American um, tribes and these outside corporations have used the initiative system trying to create um, a system. So if these fail, I would imagine this will be on the legislative agenda in the next couple of years. Okay, thank you. Okay. The next question, has the league taken a position on any of the propositions? Okay, uh, good question. Um, with our education voters hat, we're here to just provide information, but there is an advocacy arm of the league. And I will just share with you that um, the league has taken a position on after doing um, research that um, Proposition 1 they support and Proposition 31 they support. They haven't taken a position on, on the others and the gambling initiatives they didn't um, uh, study because it's not really under their, um, they, they don't uh, study uh, those, those topics. Okay. The next question is about KGO Radio and they want to know, KGO Radio, as of the past Monday, 
has gone to a 24-7 sports betting format. Is this betting so endemic in our culture that people are interested in this? I heard that these propositions are not doing that well. Okay, um, you know, I know for a fact, um, anyone who has younger children, you know, and who are interested in sports, um, you know, the fantasy leagues, uh, you may not think that that's sports betting, but in fact, it's sports betting. Um, sports betting occurs through bookies and through, there are offshore betting concerns. So I, I don't know the names of them, but I have heard that there are many young people and not just young people, there are many people who right now um, do a lot of sports betting um, from these offshore and, um, and, and bookies. And, um, you know, I think, um, you know, to answer the, the questions, I mean, I'm, I can't predict, but, but you're right. The, basically, the statistics say that these are both losing right now. Okay. And this one, I have to say, this is from someone named Brittany. He says, I am 32 years old and I have never voted because I never felt that I was well informed enough to vote. There's a part two to this. Um, but the top so uh, informed enough of the topics that were put on the ballot. But for the first time, I am, and I want to thank all involved uh, in organizing this event. You all caps, you are making a great impact. I had to read that one. That was very, <laughs> made me feel good. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Yes. Let's see. Another question. Can the federal government annul the state constitution if Prop 1 is passed to prohibit interference with women's rights about abortion? I don't believe so, but I, you know, I, th that's something that maybe someone I, I could, could look, I mean, in other words, if could the federal government um, write a law that would prohibit abortion in the states? Yeah, um, so if, the, if Prop 1 passes, can the federal government override it? Mm -hmm. Um, maybe someone more could even write in the chat what they think. I don't know for sure, but I will look that up. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Here's a comment about the propositions, and they say the propositions are doing so poorly that the sports betting companies have actually begun cutting at, at spend since last week according to the Wall Street Journal. So yeah, that was a comment. Um, I just have to add an editorial comment. It, it, it just makes one question our initiative system, the amount yeah. of money that's, that's going into these. Well, you're right about that. Um, let's see. Please update me. Um, let's see, I'm sorry. This is about if Prop 1 funds abortions for out-of-state residents who seek abortions in California? I personally, I would imagine just that those seeking abortions in California from out-of-state would be served. Um, there are many nonprofit organizations um, that would not turn someone around. I mean, and, and I, I, but I, as far as someone asked specifically if um, Medicaid from another state would, would be, uh, you know, um, recognized. That I'm not sure about. Okay. Did I hear correctly that in 2020, the union, SEIU uh, and UNW, asked that a licensed medical practitioner not, in all caps, not be present at a dialysis clinic, and now they are asking for such a professional to be present at the clinics? That's, I'm glad that this was brought up. It's been the last three election cycles that there has been, um, you know, a proposition similar to the one on the ballot um, and at uh, 29. And um, uh, the one last time required a physician to be on this, on the premises. It required a physician. This one is requiring that a physician, nurse practitioner, or a physician's assistant be on the premises. Um, last time the, the ballot initiative resoundingly failed um, because to have a physician on site, um, you know, is, would be very costly. And there's a, there's a big fear that it would in fact 
um, put a lot of dialysis clinics um, out of business. Um, and I'm just, I, I, I hope I'm, I'm sounding balanced, but one of the, the biggest complaints by SEIU, which is a union that's tried to unionize in these kidney dialysis clinics for, um, for a decade, and with, with resistance from the owners, one of their biggest um, complaints is they make 18% profit. And I think that, that people, you know, they're just questioning the ethics of anyone making a profit off of illness so that, that, that sat high. And SEIU would, you know, it, it, it looking at workers um, would like to in fact, um, you know, um, uh, add, add more, a, a bigger safety net and um, in terms of um, uh, oversight of, of the workers. It has been though shown in many studies that one doesn't need um, the professionals, uh, the nurse practitioner, PA or a doctor on site to have a safe clinic. Um, but it's, you know, again, it's, it, it's been, SEIU has been battling these two owners for, for many years. And that's why we've seen three propositions and a, a new, wrinkle, many of these clinics now are starting to be partially owned by doctors and there's not a lot of transparency. And there may be a conflict of interest, you know, if you have a doctor owning a clinic. So SEIU, that's another reason that they brought this to the fore. And that's one of the parts of this proposition. They'd like to see more transparency. Mm -hmm. And these are all things that could be legislated. They don't, you know, yes. Right. Okay, let's see. Um, could you explain lifts? Could you explain Lyft's involvement in Prop 30? Yes. The reason for financially supporting it? Yes, because they, um, you know, the state the state has said that by 2030, which is only eight years from now, they're going to have to have 90% um, uh, of their vehicles are going to have to be, you know, um, zero emission vehicles. And a lot of the drivers, um, you know, they're not of the means to buy those vehicles. Uh, Lyft is basically afraid, Lyft and the, the you know, the other ride sharing companies are afraid they're going to lose their drivers. Um, mm -hmm. So Lyft is, is supporting this because it's a way they say will, would help um, their drivers um, uh, get vehicles. Okay. There are two questions about um, Gavin Newsom, Governor Newsom. Um, do you have more information on why Governor, New why Governor Newsom is against Prop 30? And then the next question, could you clarify the pros? No, no, I'm sorry. Um, why is Gavin Newsom against Prop 30, but endorsed by Dems of California? And do you have more information on why Governor Newsom is against Prop 30? There were two questions about that. Um, basically, and I'm not saying it's purely political, but the California Teachers Association came out against Prop 30 first. And they came out because um, right now in California, because of Prop 98, we have a general fund and a certain, most of that comes from taxes and a certain percentage of that goes to schools. Prop 30, this, this um, $2 million um, you know, or over income tax um, would put uh, tax money in a separate category and Prop 98 would not apply to that. So uh, that's why the California Teachers Association is against it. They'd like to see it written so that it would go into the general fund and the education part would still be taken from it, if that makes sense. Gavin Newsom is following step. And some of it, he says, this isn't the way to budget. Um, we shouldn't be using the initiative system to impose taxes in, in, in this way. Um, it, it's a special interest. It's a, it's, in other words, the tax money is earmarked for one thing. That's not the way it should go into a general fund so that it can be, um, there could be more flexibility. Um, you know, and I'm not saying I'm one of them, but there are some who think that he's doing it for political reasons because it would mean if he's running for office again that he's raising taxes. Well, okay. But again, that's just something I've heard. Okay. Um, Janet, I think you're going to have to save these chats because there's several people who put their okay. emails in here for you to Great. answer a question Great. for I, them or I will follow up that. on a question. Fantastic. And there was someone who said uh, for us to go to see John Oliver, mm -hmm. late night host, right? John Oliver has an excellent segment on the Dallas's clinics and how much and how much profit they make. And you can find it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
Someone in here answered about um, Prop 30, ben help why benefits lift. Because by, like you said, by 2030, 90% of miles driven by Lyft uh, and Uber drivers must be um, EVs. Therefore, Lyft needs lower income ride share drivers to be able to buy EVs easier so Lyft can comply with the law. So right. you'd answer that. Someone in our chat also followed up on what you said. Um, another email for you and... I think that's about it. Well, I think we're approaching the end of the yeah. program. Yeah, 521. Uh, I actually, I see one. Well, Proposition 28. I'm sorry, Linda. Uh -huh. One more. Employ, help to employ more music and visual artists artists for K. Okay. I, I don't think it necessarily oh, artists unless the artists are considered teachers. It's, it's, I mean, it will, it will, you know what? I'll take that back. It could, it certainly could. The principals of the schools are the ones who are going to de designate where that money for music and art goes. So they could hire, um, yeah, they could hire artists, teachers. Um, I think the main point to think about, it, and I, it's just such a, a stark um, contrast, that really only 20% of our schools in California, um, you know, have a, a music and art teacher, whereas 75% in New York do. Um, the other is, um, you know, I, I, someone asked in another forum I was in, and I think this is good. They, they questioned where I got 60% of California students are lower income. They said, you know, that is that, where did you get that information? It's from the legislative analyst's office. It's from the state office. And they used the statistics of the number of kids who are getting free lunch, which is um, a, a way to, to, you know, figure that out. So. Okay. Yeah, I didn't go down far enough. I'm glad you caught that. Me being a drama teacher, former drama teacher, that's important. Oh, I know. I, I think I know you're going to vote. In no, <laughs> you already know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But we're okay. we're non we're nonpartisan. Yes. Right. So we do have to leave time for information at the end. So I just want to, because there are several people who wanted us to repeat again where they can go to find more information, and um, so uh, you can go to your local Coco Votes to Voters Edge, to Ballotpedia, and the Secretary of State's websites to get updated information, okay? And you could also, like Janet has said, you can review these videos over and over again, okay? They are very informative and they help me understand these uh, propositions, you know, better. So, and I got a lot of comments about that in our um, chat, that people really felt that they learned a lot, understood what was happening, and felt more informed after watching these videos. Thank and you. finally, if you're not already a member, we'd like to invite you to join the League of Women Voters. You can do so by visiting lwv.org and go to your local league website. Okay. And I'd like to thank my co-host, Janet. I, I wanna thank uh, you, Linda. And I just got a chat from one of our colleagues who said a shout out for Coco Votes, which is Contra Costa Votes. And then the Secretary of State, they, they have excellent data as well, SOS. Um, so those are two other um, uh, great, uh, great resources. So thank you all. Yes. I wanna thank everyone for their involvement, putting this together. It was a pleasure working with everyone involved. Thank you so much. So on behalf of the Contra Costa County Library, the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley, the League of Women Voters West Contra Costa County, and CCTV. I want to extend a genuine thank you to each of today's moderators for being here today to offer this informative and timely conversation about the pros and cons of the 2022 ballot propositions. Thank you, Ms. Linda Whitmire. Welcome. Excuse me, Whitmore, for um, being here today. And Ms. Janet Thomas, we appreciate your time and your energy and enthusiasm um, from both leagues. Thank you for representing them. I also wanna thank St. Mary's College professor, Jason Jakaitis and his students for the work they have done in partnership with the League of Women Voters to create this pros and cons video for voters. And finally, I wanna thank you, our audience for attending today and for your incredibly great questions. Thank you. This community conversation 
get the lowdown on 2022 propositions, pros and cons is being rebroadcast on CCTV on the following days and times that you see here on the screen with those specific channels that might affect you in the county. Today's community conversation will also be available on the YouTube channel of the Contra Costa County Library and the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley, which um, Ms. Whitmore has explained um, nicely earlier. Please save the date for the upcoming community conversations, book banning, lockdown on learning, which is scheduled for Thursday, November 17, at, uh, 2022 at four o'clock in the afternoon. Community conversations programs are a partnership between the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley, the League of Women Voters of West Contra Costa County, the Contra Costa County Library, and CCTV. We wanna thank you for being here this evening and hope that you will join the League of Women Voters. We are a nonpartisan organization encouraging informed and active participation in government. The League never endorses or opposes candidates or political parties. But as we, you heard earlier, we do influence public policy. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs>